this Bendigo, we're going to look at thermal imaging and a little bit of the theory behind the thermal imaging. Recall the electromagnetic spectrum where we have the uh, wavelength of the different types of radiation uh, in increasing wavelength in micrometers moving from left to right. Of course, the visible is between 0.4 to 0.7 micrometers, and then most of our thermal radiation is at longer wavelengths in the near infrared and far infrared. And so our eyes are tuned to seeing things in the visible, but of course we can't see things in the infrared with the human eye. If we look at the Planck distribution uh, for objects at two different temperatures, let's focus first at 300 degrees, which is a good average of room temperature. You'll notice that at 300 degrees, of course, the spectral emissive power is relatively low compared to the radiation from higher temperature objects. And of course, none of that falls into the, into the visual. It's all in the infrared. And so if we want to see things that are at, two, at around 300 degrees um, without having a light source on them, we're going to need to look in the infrared region. The Planck distribution is plotting the emissive power as a function of wavelength, and as we go from a lower temperature to a higher temperature, we're of course moving to smaller and smaller wavelengths and higher and higher uh, emissive powers. If instead of plotting it this way, if we pick a particular wavelength, let's imagine we're at 10 microns, and instead I plot how this spectral emissive power varies as a function of temperature, of course I'll see an increase in that emissive power as the temperature increases. And that's what I plotted here, looking at 10 microns, I plotted the Planck distribution in blue, that is the emissive power of a black body at 10 microns as a function of the temperature. And you can see that we have a nice sensitive signal, uh, say at 250 Kelvin, we're reading about 12 and a half uh, watts per meter squared per micrometer. And we increase that substantially up to over 35 as we go up to 320 Kelvin. If I look at the Planck distribution as a function of wavelength, of course the black body is the blue line, that's the perfect emitter of radiation any real object is going to have some emissivity. And in this green line here, what I plotted is an object that has an emissivity that is higher up to and including a wavelength of 10 microns, where it drops down to a lower emissivity value. And so this is, if we had an object that behaved that way, we would see this, this green line. And of course, a real surface will have variations in there and we'll see a much more uh, varying emissivity there. But so if we pick a single wavelength, the emissivity value, is going to very much change uh, what we're going to read if we measure the emission at a given wavelength. And so that's what's plotted here. Here's the black body. If I had an emissivity of 0.8, I would get this line here. And if I had an emissivity of 0.6, I would get this line here. And so that's why in your thermal camera, you have to set the emissivity of the surface. Let's imagine that the sensor on the camera is reading an emissive power of 12 and a half watts per meter squared micron, and it's measuring it perfectly just for the emission at that 10 micrometers wavelength. If I had a, a black body with an emissivity of one or something that was very close to an emissivity of one, my camera would then tell me that I was reading a temperature of 250 Kelvin. If on the other hand, the surface that I was looking at had an emissivity of 0.8, the camera would be telling me that I had a temperature of 265 degrees. If I had an emissivity of 0.6, then the camera would be telling me I was somewhere around 290 Kelvin. And then we get into a real problem when we have low emissivity materials. The red line is for an emissivity of 0.1. If that were my temperature, then the, it would be telling me that I had a temperature somewhere off my charts, but much, much higher than if I had a higher emissivity. And so it's very important that the camera knows the emissivity in order to interpret the temperature field. What it's measuring is the intensity at a given wavelength, and it's converting that into a temperature by looking at curves like this. And of course, you might notice that your thermal camera has multiple ranges. If we look at an object at 300 Kelvin or room temperature, there's a rather different distribution than if I increase that by 250 degrees to a 550 Kelvin one. And you'll notice with this logarithmic scale that of course these are about an order of magnitude, these emissive powers are about an order of magnitude higher at 550 Kelvin. And so this is the same response at that same 10 micrometers around that 500 Kelvin range. And we see, of course, these numbers are about an order of magnitude higher. And we have the exact same problems, uh, that a low emissivity object is going to be very, very hard 
uh, to get an accurate reading of. This curve is almost flat, and of course it's very different than the higher emissivity ones, so it will affect our readings substantially. And this is why the cameras will warn you that it's very difficult to get readings on low emissivity objects. Okay, let's look at what that means in practice. Here's a picture of my keyboard and my monitor stand. So here's the visual image taken at the same time by the camera, and here's the IR image. And what do we notice? This is sitting on my desk. It's probably in thermal equilibrium, such that the keyboard is all at the same temperature. And what you see is that these white keys are reading at a lower temperature than this aluminum material behind it. And of course, that's because this shiny aluminum has a much lower emissivity, and so it's reading a noticeably higher temperature, or it's indicating a noticeably higher temperature, and that's not because the temperature is different, it's because the emissivity of this material and this material is different. So when we're looking at that image, we have to be cognizant of those differences. It looks like a temperature difference because the camera is blindly interpreting it to be a material of a uniform emissivity which you have set in uh, in the settings in the camera, but in fact each of these materials has different emissivity. So we have to take that into, into account when we're interpreting the images from our IR camera. Nonetheless, there's a lot of excellent uses for IR cameras, even if it's difficult to take uh, exact readings without knowing exactly what the materials are when we have different materials all over the place. This is a, a picture taken of my home when I was looking to buy it and doing a home inspection. And we notice here that we have a range of temperatures. Uh, looking at this corner, of course, in the visual image, there's very little differences there. There's nothing really to see there. But in the IR image, we can see that in this corner here, and certainly along this whole edge, there's definitely not as good insulation here. It's much, much cooler in that corner, and we would expect to have more heat leaks at that corner where the insulation is perhaps not butted up perfectly. Um, but probably that corner wasn't done as well as it should have been done. Uh, the other thing that jumps out, that this piece here is actually the uh, encasing the chimney. And so that's an exterior there, and we're seeing that cold, um, that cold corner again as well. But more striking is this feature over here, which you don't see anything on in the visual. And what this was an indication of was that there's actually a leak in this ceiling. Um, and water got in there, which changes the conductivity of this material. And with that conductivity being different, and this being an exterior that's going to the roof of this uh, room in the house, uh, of course there's much more heat transfer through that higher conductivity wet material than if the insulation were dry. And so by using this thermal camera we're able to say there's a leak in this and it needs to be fixed before we buy the house uh, with a high degree of certainty. Here's a quick snapshot, unfortunately I didn't capture the visual of it, uh, but of my coffee grinder. And we can see here, again, it's different emissivity materials, but I can be pretty certain with this range of temperatures that this machine being left in is actually using electricity even when it's not being used. There's heat generation in there, somehow it's on standby. And so after looking at this image, though it's probably a very small amount of electricity, I started unplugging the coffee grinder and only plugging it in when I needed to use it. Another feature you might need notice here, and that we'll see later, is that this countertop is highly reflective in the infrared, though it's not nearly so reflective in the visual. We'll talk about that in a slightly different context a little bit further on in the video. Here's a picture of my office wall. And here we have some interesting features because we can see in the visual image, here's a picture frame with a metallic frame and a glass surface. And behind it is the cinder block wall. We have some electrical conduit here. And we have some pipe here, which is painted with the same paint as this wall. Now, this paint, of course, is going to have a constant emissivity. And so, interestingly, when I look at this wall surface, I can see the individual cinder blocks and the grout between those cinder blocks. And so, because this is all of a constant emissivity, I have a good idea that the relative temperature between them is an accurate representation. And there is very clearly a temperature gradient there. I can identify all the grout lines, which are reading with a darker color, which means a lower temperature, which means, not surprisingly, that the grout lines on this exterior wall have a higher conductivity than the cinder blocks, which have a large air gap in them. And so I'm having more heat transfer through all of these grout lines, and I can see that maybe this wall should have been better insulated when it was built. Uh, this pipe, which is painted with the same paint, having the same emissivity, is reading a much, much higher temperature. That's at the high end of our scale, and very clearly this is a hot water pipe. It's actually feeding, feeding the radiator that's underneath my desk there, and we're flowing hot water in there at a much, much higher temperature, which jumps out stunningly. Uh, this conduit here is an electrical conduit. It has nothing on it, and you'll notice that that's a bare, lower emissivity material. And so even though it's at the same temperature as the wall or very close to it, 
you're reading a higher temperature on this. It's at a lighter color than the wall, so you're reading a higher temperature on this, and that's really seeing the emissivity difference. And likewise, you're seeing an emissivity difference uh, or a reflectivity difference on the glass on that, on, that, uh, on that frame. Here's an interesting shot of the bathroom floor in the house during the same house inspection. And what you can see here is, of course, nothing in the visual image, but I turned on the in-floor heating. And very, very quickly, before you can even feel the heating on your feet, you can see the heating coils in this floor and you can again see or you can see another issue when you're looking at your house inspection that they cut some corners in building this floor of course these tile these pads of heaters should be laid out side by side without this gap between them and they've saved a little bit of money by putting these out on an angle and putting them in a w pattern instead of laying them out side by side what does that mean in practice it means that when your nice in floor heating is on you have a rather large cold spot on the floor and it's about the size of your foot if you look at that and so you can be standing happily in there with one foot hot and one foot cold this is something that they obviously never should have done and it was good to know that before actually buying the house here's another shot of my keyboard again and here's an interesting application that maybe one should be careful of when I push this key, of course, I transfer heat from my hotter uh, hand to the keyboard. And if I take a thermal image of that, you can tell exactly which keys have most recently been pressed. If that was perhaps my password was en I was entering, it would reduce the combination of guesses I had to make to guess that password because I would know exactly which keys were involved in the process of entering that. Something that one should be careful of in designing, say, an, an ATM or an, uh, a bank machine, uh, where if somebody comes with a with an infrared camera, they can probably pick out your PIN number or at least reduce the combinations dramatically. If you look carefully, many of those ATMs are made with very low emissivity um, and high conductivity keys, metallic type keys, that are going to dissipate that very, very quickly and hopefully not leave much time for this image to be taken. Here's an interesting picture in the uh, living room of the dog. Of course, you can see in the visual uh, that you can hardly see the dog. You have to look sort of twice to see it but they jump out very, very clearly in the infrared. You can see the interesting uh, feature with the, the fur on the dog, and of course the, the eyes and the nose are showing at a higher temperature than, when the fur, than where the fur is. But there's also another couple of fun features that jump out of this picture. First of all, you can see that somebody was very recently sitting on that couch. The emissivity of the couch is the same everywhere, and yet it's hotter right here. You can also surmise that they were probably putting their leg up on the coffee table. Again, this material has all the same emissivity, and uh, there's a hot spot there where someone's leg, perhaps the person that took the picture, was recently seated. And finally, here's an interesting picture of a window. Now, here's the visual of the exact same picture, or of the, the same window at the same time that we're looking here. It looks out the window into the house across the street, and here in the infrared, we see a perfect reflection of the gentleman who took this picture. While in the visual range, at 0.4 to 0.7 micrometers, this window is perfectly transparent, if you look at the transmissivity of glass, you'll find that most glasses go from a high transmissivity to almost zero transmissivity, somewhere on the order of 4 microns, or maybe between 2 and 4 microns. Well, 2 to 4 microns puts us in this range that is firmly in the infrared. If the transmissivity drops to zero, that means it's no more transparent, it's fully reflective. And even if it were at 4 microns, the amount of energy in the range from 4 to infinity, the shaded part in this diagram, is 0.998. So even at 4 microns, which is the higher end of the where the transmissivity drops off for most glasses, 99.8% of the energy is still at a value where the window is no longer transparent. And so the thermal camera sees that window as a perfect mirror. It's perfectly opaque, it's reflecting all of that back, and you're seeing my reflection in that window instead of through, whereas in the visible, visible of course, the transmissivity is very high. You see right, the, 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 the visible part of the spectrum goes right through that window, and that's why we use it as a window.